Today, I want you to meet my friend, Sara Marzini. Sara and I have so much in common. We both like listening to Oriental house music, we're both foodies who like to eat a lot and later complain about how much we just ate. We both want to become lawyers and fight for the human rights issues we believe in, and we're both Syrian. I was born in America, but I said my first words, took my first steps, and grew up in Aleppo. Sara grew up in Damascus, several hours south. These same cities that have now been described as some of the most dangerous places on Earth were once our homes. But it wasn't always like this. Syria was once an economically thriving and vibrant country. Sara and I grew up in cities that were peaceful and gave each individual a sense of belonging. Sara and I loved going to souks and wandering the alleys. Mothers could leave their kids in strollers outside of stores while they shopped, and you could safely walk the town day or night. Sada is an accomplished swimmer and spent many hours a week in the pool. Meanwhile, I was busy with piano lessons and tennis. I never had to worry that Sada is Muslim and I'm Christian because religions coexisted in this area I grew up in. Our happy childhoods are probably not what you first imagined when I told you Sada and I grew up in Syria. And although we share so much, we left Syria under very different circumstances. I left Aleppo August 3rd, 2011 by plane. I'm so grateful I saved this plane ticket because it means so much to me today. I love to go to university in Boston, but I never imagined I'd be leaving indefinitely. Now, it has almost been eight years. My dad might never return to his home. Still, I was one of the lucky few that managed to easily leave Syria by plane without having to witness horrors, watch family members pass away, and experience hardships as a refugee. This is where mine and Sarah's stories diverge. Sara, like so many refugees, had to embark on a life-risking journey towards Europe by sea because the land border crossings were closed. Sara and her sister Yusra were forced to put their lives in the hands of a smuggler that exploited them by putting them on a dinghy that was barely functioning. Only 15 minutes into the crossing, the engine of the dinghy failed. Sara recalls telling herself she did not want to die and was not ready to die as she jumped into the water to begin pulling the dinghy. Yusra, also a trained swimmer, was by her side the entire way. Together, they courageously dragged the boat to safety by swimming for three hours and a half. Sara's agonizing journey continued as she and her sister were taken to a registration center known as Moria, where the refugees are greeted by police and the conditions in the ref refugee camp are not livable. Although Sara and I share so much, the vast difference between our stories can be traced to our passports. Mine American, her Syrian. When the refugee crisis escalated at the end of 2015, the media was filled with images of devastated refugees arriving with only the belongings they could carry. I couldn't seem to wrap my head around this because I was able to easily leave by plane at the start of the war. I felt a deep sense of responsibility to my fellow Syrians and I was compelled to try to help in any way possible. So I began to search for organizations on the ground and I came across the Boat Refugee Foundation, a Dutch NGO. Many of the volunteers had no direct attachment to the refugees, yet they would work day and night to try to make a single person feel human again. That is how I became a volunteer on the Greek island of Lesbos. When you first hear the words Greek island, chances are you picture something like this. Let your mind wander along this beach for five seconds. What about this image? What is different from your expectations and from the beach you imagined? This exercise reflects what it's like to have your perception changed after going through a volunteering experience. This is where my mind wanders now whenever I look at a beach because of my time in Lesbos. Lesbos is known as a gateway island for refugees seeking asylum in Europe. From where I was working, I could see the coast of Turkey across the ocean. Like Sara, many refugees arrive on an overcrowded dinghy intended to hold 20 people but carrying up to 70 people on board. To make matters worse, they're given fake life jackets made out of styrofoam, a material that cannot actually save lives. I got to visit the so-called life jacket graveyard. It was filled with piles of bright orange life jackets, torn rubber rafts, and children's floaty devices. As I looked at this graveyard, I was struck by the sheer number of life jackets of all the people they represented and of the lives lost. The first time I went to Lesbos, I went with an emotional guard up because I didn't know what to expect. 
As a Syrian that hadn't experienced these same hardships, I was privileged, and I didn't know how to feel about that. I remember one refugee saying, we're both Syrian, but at the end of the day, you get to leave, and I remain here a refugee. When meeting the refugees, I wanted to get to know them beyond just their refugee status. I wanted to get to know them as people so that I can show that they were exactly like you and me. I returned to Lesbos a second time in May of last year, and I worked with the Emergency Rescue Center International, a search and rescue organization. My experience with ERCI was even more hands-on, helping with boat landings, patrolling the oceans, and rescuing people. I wish I could say that conditions in the camps had improved, but for the most part, they hadn't. Many of the refugees I had previously met were still stuck in limbo because of slow processing of their asylum applications. I was struck by how much had happened for me in one year, while so little had changed for them. During the months that I was away from Lesbos, I kept in touch with many of the refugees I had met. Our bonds became stronger and a relationship of trust was established. So I went, when I returned the second time, it was much easier for them to naturally open up to me and unconsciously share bits and pieces of their journeys. I saw and felt the real impact I could have. Something as simple as sharing a smile with someone who had gone through so much was enough. On a few occasions, refugee parents would come up to me and say, I hope that our own daughters could someday do the same type of work that you were doing. As much as I wanted this to fill me with hope, I couldn't help but feel sadness that these girls wouldn't actually have my same privilege to do the same type of work that I was doing. I met Sara my second time while working in Lesbos, while working with ERCI. I remember her saying she saw me as the person that she could have been if the war in Syria hadn't happened. Yet, what Sara didn't realize is that she is a literal role model to all these young girls as someone who endured their same situation. I left, and I couldn't remember how things were. I remember, what, before volunteering, I had been desensitized by statistics, numbers, and dramatic headlines, which make us all forget about the human element. Taking down my emotional walls and listening to people's flight stories allowed me to fully understand the depth of this crisis. It wasn't just impacting the handful of families that I had met in Lesbos, but all the other refugees scattered in Lebanon, Jordan, Turkey, and other parts of Europe. I felt like a tiny person in the face of an enormous crisis. So what do you do when you leave a place like Lesbos to return home? For me, home is Boston. For Sara, it is Berlin. How do you deal with it all emotionally? When I returned to Boston, I couldn't help but feel guilty that I could easily get on a plane again and leave Lesbos while the refugees I admired remained trapped. I was no longer in Lesbos physically, but my heart and mind were. I jumped right back into law school, but I would be sitting in class and my mind would wander towards the stories I had heard and the people I had met. I remember the first day of my international law class, we had to go around, say our names, and say where we were from. After I introduced myself, I couldn't help but recall little Yusuf, who when asked where he was from, had said from here, from the camp, even though I knew that he was actually also from Aleppo. For me, there'll always be a beautiful and untouched Aleppo, but for this little boy, there was only the refugee camp with no before and possibly no after. Yet, Yusuf's resiliency was, changed my perspective on so many things. He was always smiling. When you're there on the ground volunteering, you don't have the time to mentally process everything because so many things happen in one day. When I had time to reflect at home, it is these small yet meaningful interactions with people that I would think back on the most. I came back to my comfort zone, but I no longer found comfort in it. A feeling of guilt also sank in because I was no longer in the field helping. But I quickly realized that this feeling of guilt was not productive. I wanted to share these stories and I wanted people around me to hear them. So I decided to start a social media page called, called Meet a Refugee. Meet a Refugee gave my funds a platform to connect with the world, I would reflect back and raise awareness at the same time. As soon as I began writing about my friends, I felt as if I had lifted a huge weight off my shoulders. What I've learned from doing this type of work is to not lose hope. Think about the lives you have impacted and take the time to reflect at home before jumping back into your ordinary routine. 
You may feel guilty for going on and continuing on with your life, but you could channel that guilt into doing something from home. For me, it was starting my Meet a Refugee page. With this platform, I could virtually visit other refugee camps, which was something that I had always wanted to do. By sharing my story, I hope I could compel you to contribute towards solving this refugee crisis. The magnitude can be overwhelming, but it doesn't have to be. To resolve this refugee crisis, it will take involvement on all levels. There are many ways that you can help that are small and accessible. Welcome newly arrived refugees by contacting your local resettlement agencies. Donate to organizations on the ground. Remain aware of the conditions of the countries people are fleeing and stay engaged with the crisis even if it has left the media spotlight. S support local businesses that hire refugees. Amplify refugee voices. You could be the small piece in the puzzle that together makes a big impact in the lives of real people. And now, I want you to all participate in Meet a Refugee. I would like to welcome to the stage Sada, who's in the audience with us today. Thank you.